So uh, <clears throat> welcome back, everyone. Um, so we're going to have a cross collaboration panel, and we might have a few a uh, few people joining us. Um, and uh, who might come a little late, but anyway, I, I want to introduce introduce you to uh, the panel that we have. Um, so we have uh, myself, Douglas Mayo. Uh, I, I do some. I'm going to sort of moderate this, and um, and then uh, we have Adrian Schroeder. Adrian works on OBS. Um, so Ben Ben Cotton, your Ben's the um, uh, release manager for. For Fedora, we have Matthew Miller just coming in here. Um, we also have uh, Dan Cermak. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correct, Dan. Um, please uh, feel free that to. That depends uh, on how you de how you define that, but close enough. Yeah, and it looks like Neil Gompa has joined us as well. Um, so thank you, um, thank you all for being a part of this panel. Um, so if, if you wouldn't, um, actually, yeah, looks like Maria, Marie, uh, just joined us. Thank you. Um, so Maria and I are kind of, uh, going to narrow or moderate this, but you know, we're obviously going to have input as well. Um, and so the format is kind of go, we're roughly going to be here for an hour. Uh, if we, if we, if we could go that long, we could go much further. Um, but just to start off uh, a few questions could could you each like tell me a little bit about yourself and what you work on and we could start probably um we'll start with ben hi so i'm uh the fedora program manager i've been in this role uh, for about three years and basically my job is the chief chief cat herding officer um basically you know managing the fedora release schedule and uh making sure we're actually sticking to it and uh, gently encouraging people to, to come along and follow the processes. I've been a member of the Fedora community for over 10 years, um, and I sort of tangentially participate in several other open source projects as well. I guess we'll go with Dan. Hi, I'm Dan. I'm a software developer at SUSE. I work in the developer engagement program that I've started out working on vagrant boxes, then built a few Visual Studio Code extensions. And besides that, I also contribute to a few, uh, to a few open source projects. I'm active in the open uh, SUSE community as a package maintainer. And then I'm also quite active in the Fedora community. So I'm part of the i3 special interest group where we released the i3 spin of Fedora. I recently got elected into FESCO in the Fedora Engineering Steering Committee. So yeah, I have my feet also there. And Marie, if you want to like tell us a little bit about yourself and take over. Sure. Um, my name is Marie Norden. I am Fedora's Community Action and Impact Coordinator. That is a community uh, agreed upon name. It's very long. It means <laughs> community manager, support person. So I help uh, with a lot of the administrative type things behind Fedora, but I also work on community initiatives and I work with a lot of the non-coding teams, uh, giving them guidance and support and also work with mentored projects, the BNI team. So I do a whole bunch of stuff with Fedora. I'm gonna pick on Matt next, Matthew next. Okay, um, I'm Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader. Um, that means I throw cats at Ben. I think that's the, the main responsibility. Um, in seriousness, um, Fedora, is a community directed and community led project so it means that as a leader my job isn't to tell the community where to go but to help the community find its collective direction and actually go there um, because i think the nature of communities is to go in every direction at once and that's not always the most effective way to get somewhere um, it's an interesting search technique but um, not not the most efficient one so 
uh, my job is to help us be more efficient, really. Um, do I pick on the next person? Is that how we're doing this? Why? Why not? Why not? Neil, go. <laughs> Oh, all right then. Lovely. Um, so my name's Neil Gampa. I am uh, someone who's all over open source stuff. Um, professionally, uh, I am a senior DevOps engineer at Datto, uh, working on software delivery stuff and release engineering type things. Um, but in the open source world, I am a long time member of both the Fedora and OpenSUSE communities. I've been a member of Fesco for a year now, uh, but also I am a member of the OpenSUSE board since January. Uh, and I do quite a lot in the KDE, SIG and Fedora, as well as the workstation working group, um, cloud working group, a number of other places. And I'm also in the OpenSUSE heroes team helping build up infrastructure and setting up solutions to help support um, the OpenSUSE community to do, you know, great things. And you work so much with Adrian, you probably could have just passed it on to him. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Hi, Adrian. Hi, Neil. <laughs> yeah, I'm Adrian Schröter. I'm in OpenSUSE. I'm in first place responsible for the open build service. Um, yeah. and then someone gets new ideas how to build distributions uh, like with, with the jump concepts and I have to work on that. Um, and apart from that, I take care about all the configurations from the non-SUSE distributions in the build service. So, and try to help out people. Yeah, and in the old times, I actually was a project manager in of the OpenSUSE project when it started and before that i was doing the kde desktop at, at SUSE. my daughter is messaging me that there's a large bug in the backyard and to come and save them um, but I, I think this is one that she can probably handle herself <laughs> sorry for the distraction <laughs> so it's not a panel blocking bug right <laughs> Well, so, you know, we kind of have some list of questions that we, we kind of came up with together. Um, and, and I guess, you know, we've already talked a little bit about the background, but sort of one of the aspects of that was, um, you know, how, what sort of cross collaboration uh, do you have within the projects you're working with? If anyone wants to take that, feel free, um, feel free to just answer. So we certainly have some tooling level Cross collaboration, where a, you know, a really big example is the OpenQA service that we use that came from SUSE, and it's really instrumental to Fedora's testing efforts at this point. Um, and then we also have some key shared code, like the um, library that DNF uses to actually do its work comes from SUSE. Um, and then, of course, we also have a lot of interest in shared upstream projects where we work together. I think that's yeah, the I was high say level. We have Neil, and yeah, uh, right. Neil, Neil does all cross collaboration and, with all projects right. ever. And we've got Dan, so we've got actually some um, Venn diagram overlap of people as well, which is awesome. Yeah, and since you mentioned uh, since you mentioned LibSolve, which is at the heart of LibDNF, now uh, if I understood it correctly, nowadays. Um, the uh, micro uh, open source micro OS, which is using transactional update, that in turn is now using libdnf. So it's oh, interesting. Went back. Yeah. So, <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> earlier this year, um, uh, Richard Brown and I switched open source micro OS for desktops uh, from using uh, the weird shell wrapper thingy called Zipper to using a libdnf plugin that implements the whole transactional updates mechanism so that package kit can use it and so gnome software can actually do upgrades this way as well as plasma discover and any of those other uh things like that we also have micro dnf now able to do um transactional updates with butterfs and things like that and there's some further development down the pipeline to enable it for cockpit as well and 
so that there's some there's some fun stuff going on with that and i'm hoping that we will have you know the dnf package manager with the transactional updates enablement actually used throughout micro os on all flavors desktop server whatever uh, because it it's actually worked out real nice and made for a much cleaner experience uh, for integrating in the stack. Yeah, I think we also got some, we have some decent collaboration in the Rust uh, ecosystem. As far as I know, the Fedora Rust special interest group was uh, leveraging the open build service quite a lot. I guess Adrian flinches now because I, I I think it caused quite some strain on on the build service in a few uh, at a few times but uh, there's been some some call up in there as far as I'm I think, aware I think they've also bugs that some resources were not freed and taken endless but uh, yeah that's got solved that's that's it gave Michael some heartburn when uh, when we when we started doing the dynamic build dependencies in OBS because uh, the processes would get hung and it would just kind of stay there, uh, keeping the VMs up even after the builds were done. Because uh, okay. every time the Oops. every time you ran the build process, it starts up a brand new virtual machine and runs the whole build process inside of there. But because it didn't know that the dynamic build dependencies cycle was complete could keep the VM running, doing nothing. So I, I have a question about this at a, at a higher level. Um, Rust is an example, but basically uh, every every language, especially every new language, has its own package manager, its own way of doing things. And as Fedora, we've struggled with what the best way to provide a good experience for users, um, both developers who are using those languages and then consumers of those developers work like um, in our in our world. And our traditional answer has been, you know, to cram all of that through RPM um, with increasing automation, which is definitely cramming it all through RPM with one with automation is definitely one approach. Um, there might be other approaches to do that. Um, so I guess on the Rust thing um, in specific, um, I think people see little value. It's hard, it's hard for us to convince the world of the value of putting Rust crates into RPM format. Um, arguably, there's value, uh, but it's a it's an argument that we have to continually make if we want to say that. Um, I think that there is almost zero value in both the Fedora community doing it and the OpenSUSE community doing it. So. Um, how could we make it so that it is just one community doing that packaging? Nice. We would have to sit down and and essentially come up with a way how we want to do that. But yeah. there's also there's also a limit to how far we should go since we can't package the world anymore, at least with Rust, with Node.js these uh, these ecosystems, they have really small standard libraries. And they have he they have huge dependency stacks, and at a, at a certain point you really come down to to think: Does packaging everything as RPMs does that really provide additional value? It does if you can uh, if you can, for instance. Uh, so what there's been some recent development for the in the build service to provide. Uh, to, pro uh, to provide vendoring of the uh, of the dependencies where you can replace certain parts of them with uh, with rpms that you ship and certain parts that you take from upstream and there you could say okay we have these core libraries where we provide support as a distribution or as an enterprise and uh, then and the rest you can just grab from um, from npm or from from crates yeah. io, but, but yeah. Uh... But, yeah, okay. That uh, three different problems from my point of view. I mean, you are right that I mean the build part is one problem, and we could automate it or do it in RPMs or not RPMs. This is one discussion. But the other problem is if you do it not in app or not in a unified format. Then you would need to deal with the cross dependency between the RPM world and Ruby gems and 
Python pip and so on. So if you update my MySQL, it has an effect on all the other formats. And then you need to transfer this logic into, into the update tooling. So DNF, Zipper, and so on would need to learn about it. I mean, I think there's no wrong or right answer here. I think we can, should work in all directions uh, and evaluate. We can't know, we can't limit people to use other formats. Um, we can't force people to RPMs, but on the other side, there is still additional value. I completely agree. But what I think from the origin of the question, um, when working together with packages, no matter if it's Rust or whatever, I think there is really the big amount of our packages we could really maintain together. And I think our tooling is, is blocking us there at the moment because build service is so much different than Koji and, and whatever, copper or whatever else you have. And that's definitely an area where we should, I mean, we, we don't need to consolidate the build tooling, we, but we should maybe consolidate how we maintain sources in the first place. So that yeah, and I think this, what's also think blocking us is convention. So we have really, um, there's really different conventions between OpenSUSE and Fedora in certain regards. So in, in Rust, it's relatively uh, comparable since they have uh, essentially the same heritage. But if you take a look at, um, if you take a look at Python packaging, it works, it works kind of differently. If you take a look at Go, I think that's completely different. If you take a look at Ruby gems, it's also quite different, although OpenSUSE uses uh, a forked version of gem to RPM. So I think to to really um, to to really come uh, to share our sources together, we'd have to all sit together at one table and decide we are going to do it now this way and reduce the reduce the differences that we have. That's, so we uh, did this once before about a decade ago where we came together and reconsolidated um, the way that our, our structures and guidelines and our packages were, I think it was 2011 or something like that, where um, basically OpenSUSE and Fedora communities uh, after like, it was a desktop summit or something like that, where the guidelines were reforked from Fedora to start over the guidelines in OpenSUSE and things were built off from there. What I think failed after that effort was there was no ongoing communication between the two projects to, to solve problems together. So like something that when the Fedora Rust SIG was being assembled that Igor uh, Rates and I um, did together was we made sure that the stakeholders from the different distributions that started the project together stayed in contact throughout the time that the stuff evolved. And that's something that we probably should be doing if we want to like make that successful this time around. From a tooling perspective, I agree with Adrian that like we don't necessarily need to be like, all right, Koji, OBS, smush, done. That's probably one not going to happen, and and two, uh, very very difficult. Um, but you know, we can do things like there's experiments going on with you know pulling the sources out of OBS's version control system into a diskit style system with code.opensuse.org, which is a Pagger instance. Like we can we can start, and, and the OBS team has actually started working on SCM integration with Forges, uh, and they're working on Pagger integration that could actually be used in this manner. So we could start leveraging some of the same conventions and you know blending a little bit of you know best practices to to try to make this better and easier to share uh, between the two two projects. One place that would uh, make sense to me is the source git thing that some people in Fedora and Red Hat have been working on, which is basically maintain the um, version of you know, the spec file stuff in, in in an upstream repository rather than in disk git, you know, actual fork of the of the upstream source. Um, and then use automation to go to disk it and then to build from there. Um, it seems like maybe it could be made so the same source git tree could then go to um, mm. SUSE's git and build system from there, but yeah. using you know, the same original source. Uh, that would be a huge win. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just want to correct a bit uh, the, the things about the continuous integration support at the moment. Uh, this is not, not the, I mean, this has a different purpose, but we are working also on an, an, an alternative asset stores. Uh, so that entire projects even can be replaced with the Git, so that an external Git can be, or other protocols can be used. So that would be the vehicle in, in our case. And yes, then we could it, it exactly achieve this, and it doesn't matter if it's Git or if we agree on anything else. Um, it's more important, I think, that we do the sources, yeah, the, the source hosting together, and what's for me, especially important, I think, is that we agree how do we validate which sources we can trust. What is what? Uh, how do we yeah. trust upstream projects and so on? Because I see there the biggest value in, in in our aggregation. The build is, yeah, that's also something we need to deal. But the really, really important and valuable uh, work we do is is collecting the the trust. Right. Um. Actually, that brings to mind another uh, thing, which is license um, identification in packages. Um, I have no idea what uh, you folks do in SUSE with that. Um, They're SPDX. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which, which is um, which is excellent because we are actually working on um, a project to, to possibly move Fedora to SPDX mm -hmm. for our license tagging. Um, it's yeah. there's there's a lot of work to go there, um, but um, that means that we can audit everything. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that would would help um, collaboration there there as well. Yeah, and especially we could also leverage projects like Cable, which uh, is a license uh, that's a license checker module that runs in the Open Build service, and uh, it essentially scans all the sources that you throw into a package and tries to find out all kinds of licenses. It, it's pretty good. It finds all kinds of interesting things. So I've, uh, uh, about a year ago, I've packaged uh, our studio for OpenSUSE and then uh, through that it came into Fedora. And it found a lot of licenses that are that upstream bundled and wasn't aware of. It also found a bunch of stuff that upstream still thought they had bundled and didn't anymore for five years. Yeah. So. What is that tool called? Cavill. Uh, Cavill. C A V I L. Yeah, former, formerly known as License Sticker. Maybe License Sticker was the old name. Oh, yeah. License Sticker was the old name. So, something well, that might be interesting. Still called that. If, the bot is still called. Yeah. One, something that might be interesting would be uh, if we could get Cavill deployed in Fedora infrastructure and then wire up a bot to do it on Pagger PRs. Yeah. And we could also replace the the thing that's done in Fedora review with with the uh, with using Cavill and see like start using it that way. And maybe yeah, we could also throw share it into Fedora CI or into yeah. Bodhi. And we could also share we the actually, license corpus that we use. We actually discussed Fedora and OpenSUSE. We discussed this in Dresden a little bit, Matthew. Um, a few yeah. Years back. Um, so Red Hat has a tool called. Pelk, which is used internally, P-E-L-C, uh, that is part of the RHEL process, and it's an internal tool, not a public tool. Um, and we've had some talks about open sourcing this. Um, I feel like SUSE does this, and we could collaborate. Might be something um, we we could, we could um, move towards. I saw Neil's face of there's a tool that exists that I've never heard heard of before. Yes. <laughs> What language is it written in out of curiosity? Um, it's been around for a long time. So my guess Pearl? is Python, but um, there's a small chance of it being Perl, right? Uh, All right. <laughs> I, I don't actually know. I haven't Cavill, actually looked. Cavill is Perl, so... <laughs> If it so, uh, uh, we could merge all the pearls. Excellent. Yeah, if it, if merge all the pearls is one thing, but then if it's Python, then we'll have to have a shootout and figure out which code base is less awful to work with. The one that's not in Perl is the one that's less awful to work with. Come on. I, <laughs> and I'm not even wearing my Perl shirt today, but I have one that I wear all the time. I love Perl, but uh... Matthew, I'm trying to be diplomatic here. <laughs> 
well it's not it's too really, bad it's really hard <laughs> if you, uh, to, to like transition though because i don't want to yep. you know we have we have a lot of other things we want to want to hit on and uh, oh yeah gonna, uh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna go to ben here um so and i'm gonna read this because i couldn't break it up uh, so so easily but um you know the messages really of um collaborating amongst the projects really resonates um i think we see it as as we you know we talk about it and so does, does anyone in, well actually ben do you have any opinion about why that is and um you know what kind you, of message you just started out with ben Ben, yes. <laughs> well, he, Ben said he would do it. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and you asked if I have a, an opinion, which is a funny question to ask. Um, yeah, you know, I think, you know, think about my own experience. I got started contributing to Fedora because I had been using it, and like, here's this thing that I'm getting for free, and people are, you know, putting effort into doing, and I felt sort of in just. Uh, ethical obligation to give back to the community. And I think that's true to some degree for a lot of people who participate in open source projects. And so, you know, the whole idea is that you're putting your, your code or your documentation or your design or whatever out there for everyone else to also use. And so it's just sort of inherently collaborative. Um, and because, you know, there's not these strict boundaries of, yeah, you know, we have Fedora and OpenSUSE and Ubuntu and Debian and all these other distributions that have some differences, but we're all using the Linux kernel. You know, we're all using the same basic, uh, you know, user land tools. So like there's not this strict thing where I'm working in this one community and I'm only going to work here because nothing touches. Like as soon as you start working on anything that goes into a distribution, you're almost certainly impacting other distributions and then it starts to make sense to work together. So Dan, actually, I think you said you would probably also, uh, could. Yeah. I mean, I'm, a, I'm afraid Ben, uh, Ben already said most of the, uh, most of the important parts since if you if you do open source at least in my opinion open source or more or less for me open source is to a good extent about the community about the people it's not all it's it's also about the code and that you can that you can modify it but it's also mostly about the people with that uh, with whom you work with and then then it's about collaboration and it's kind of wired into the into the heart of the whole thing. I mean, you can you put it out there into the public so that people can can reuse it. And I mean, the whole thing started like that. So it's kind of baked into its genes. Okay. Well, okay. So, so the benefits. Uh, I mean, you could see the benefits uh, with collaborating. Uh, do you have any, actually, do, do any of you have any specific examples that you could think of? So I guess the earliest example really for me that I think really demonstrates this quite well is when I started working on bringing up support for, um, soft float arm architecture. So like the really crappy, like useless arm architectures um, for DNF and, and RPM. So that involved, you know, going to at the DNF level, adding in the markers to identify to that, but also teaching libsolve how to do it and going through to that, which meant touching to both a Red Hat project and an OpenSUSE project, and then going to open build service so that it would learn how to actually um, sort that and be able to select the correct builders for that as well. And those sorts of things. Uh, like when I was doing that architecture bring up for a professional project, thankfully nobody will ever see the light of day of it because it was a terrible thing and I don't ever really want to do that again. But, uh, but because uh, because it was something that involved so many, you know different distributions, different projects, I even found you know there was a Linux distribution that was actually shipping RPM-based distribution with DNF and all this stuff, uh, 
you know, for Arm V5. And they were like, yeah, you know, if you can help us out with, you know, getting this all fully working with this new stack, that'd be great. And it's like, all right, sure. And they tested some of my patches and, and made sure that it worked. And, you know, so like with a little bit of Magia's help and, and you know, Michael Schroeder's help in, in LibSolve and Adrian in Open Build Service uh, and, um, and uh, Yaroslav Ranchek, I'm sorry, I screwed up that name. I'm sure I messed that name up. Um, in the DNF team, uh, it, it went fairly well and I was able to easily like work with a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of random people to get something that was both simple and complicated at the same time actually done and usable. And no, Arm yeah, yeah. is still a terrible architecture. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, a good, another good example is also is also OpenQA, which uh, was also previously mentioned. I mean, OpenQA is re relied on by. I mean, that's the thing that makes OpenSUSE tumbleweed roll and be actually pretty stable for a rolling release distribution that releases uh, up to five times a week. If you compare that to other rolling release distros, which break, 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 and break. Um, that we won't name names. <laughs> no, we won't. Um, but uh, so it's uh, and a good chunk of that is is achieved by OpenQA and then Fedora using it. Uh, you uh, you see quite uh, you see especially Adam. We uh, you see especially Adam contributing to OpenQA, uh, also upstream and fixing stuff that uh, that uh, that sort of uh, is used by Fedora, and um, so I think that's that's one of the that's a pretty good example. And Adam also added something unique to the OpenQA ecosystem that I found really <laughs> handy. He wrote a Python client for OpenQA, so I didn't have to write <laughs> curl code to interface with it. Aha! Uh -huh. You're <laughs> not going to get away from that fight. We're going to come back to it. <laughs> I figured I, I just pointed out like. Adam added something that actually made it much more usable for a broader set of people. And that, that helped me start like, you know, poking at it and testing. Like whenever I'm working with open QA stuff, like either an open SUSE or Fedora, I use the Python open QA client so that I can, you know, automatically go find something, fetch it and, and take a look at stuff because, you know, there's a lot of stuff in, in open QA and, and navigating oh, yeah. by hand is, is very, very annoying. Um, and if you if you want to uh, uh, and if we want to go down this uh, Python versus Perl route, OpenQA is now also <laughs> adding uh, adding a Python API. So in case you don't like Perl at all and don't want to use the test API, you will be able to use the uh, Python based test API soon. But it looks I can, exactly I can the same. I expect Adam to port everything over to Python. I expect that will happen. <laughs> possible but it looks the same so sure but it's it's the thought that counts <laughs> and then we'll rewrite it in rust okay you're banned uh... <laughs> it works but if you have a common goal and both have advantages of it then collaboration works mostly automatically in most cases it's important to find the common goal and the common benefit yeah, that, that's, I Actually, think, been the hardest part in general was just finding a way to bring everyone to realize that there is a common goal, because a lot of times, you know, people don't realize that, you know, they may be framing the problem differently in their head or they're thinking of it in different terms, but it's still like the same kind of thing and everyone's still, and, and sharing the workload, you know, many hands make light work is, you know, an old phrase that is still true even today, like, Collaborating makes it a lot easier for us to do bigger and bigger things together better. In, in doing the questions, um, we had one that a lot of you actually responded to that you would want to answer. And one was, and it kind of is opposite of what we're talking about, but uh, co collaboration can sometimes feel like a drag on innovation. Um, because of the required effort to communicate and synchronize 
uh, with many different people. So how do you overcome this feeling? Oh man, <laughs> yeah. that one, that one seems like it speaks to me in particular. Uh, the, the hard part really is trying to, the, the hard part about making the collaboration work is trying to not necessarily make it someone else's problem because that's a lot of what, sometimes that's what a lot of people kind of default to, but trying to find a way to have everyone see the benefit of solving the problem. Uh, and the reason I find it important to do that, even though that it's pretty grungy and, and unrewarding work most of the time, uh, is because the end result is I get more people that can help me solve the problem better. Because in a lot of cases, if I'm doing the thing by myself, I'm not a 10x engineer. I do not, I do not have the capability to make magic out of nothing. I am not that good. And, <laughs> and the only way I'm even halfway successful on anything that I'm doing is because I can get help from others who are willing to chip in uh, and and right. that, make it that's, successful. That's the real 10x engineer right there, the one who can convince 10x engineers to uh, work with them, right? I still feel like a failure after dry. <laughs> <laughs> Did, does I mean, anyone so... Else? Go ahead. It may sound a little self-serving, but I think having somebody you know, in that sort of act as like a project or program manager role who their contribution is just managing some of the collaboration and the communication uh, really helps. You know, Fedora didn't have somebody in my role originally and it was sort of a crazy disaster. Now it's a slight, slightly less crazy disaster. Um, but I think, you know, that sort of the same principles apply when you get into you know smaller even sort of more ad hoc collaboration is if there's not somebody sort of keeping the cats all going in the same direction uh, you then do have to communicate with each person individually one-on-one -on -one, and that becomes just an unmanageable overhead i'm going to echo that for the community based work as well People are hard. Not me. Oh, come on, Adrian. <laughs> I think you kind of have the hardest yeah. job of all. You have to make all the things work for everyone. No, 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 no. no. I have to excuse that it's all content. All problems are only, it's only the content. <laughs> I'm never gay. <good. laughs> I don't Same. know. I distinctly remember a couple of times where I have to go in and ask you, like, hey, this thing is not working because um, stuff's missing. <laughs> what do? My daughter has solved her insect problem by deciding to go to the mall with her friends. Uh, That's an, an interesting solution. <laughs> solution makes sense, honestly. I'm proud. Who among us has never said bugs are hard? Let's go shopping, though. <laughs> <laughs> fair yeah but i would i think what what really helps uh helps in terms of collaboration if it feels like a drag is to essentially consider if i if i push this stuff upstream yes it's going to be more work in the short term but in the long term i get more eyes i get more people to look at that and so, so in the the long term solution is very likely going to be better. So that really that really at least helps me because I I know I mean sometimes you submit a pull request somewhere and then then the discussion starts and then it goes around in circles and weeks later it's still not merged and at some point you get annoyed and you think oh I could just fork this thing and be done with it and then the project lives for 10 years and you think oh damn it i should have I, I should have been maybe a bit more resilient and actually go through with this pull request so i i think the i think in the in the long term usually collaborating tends out to work 
to work out uh, positively for everyone. I have a response to this. For myself personally, overcoming that feeling, it's a lot of adaptation and not being so like, don't hold on to your idea of what the outcome of this is going to be. Let it evolve and kind of accept that, embrace it. That's how I go about it, at least with the with the non-coding, you know, teams within Fedora working amongst themselves. I'd probably say coding, programming, that's the easy part. That's that's the part that honestly does not matter very much most of the time. The actually getting people to sit in a room together and not throw pitchforks at each other. That is the hard part. That is even the... sitting in the room. Oh my goodness. Yes. Like that's those are the things that really strain my desire to do this kind of stuff because it, it's it's really difficult sometimes when you have really unfortunate personalities is the way I'm going to describe this. Really unfortunate personalities in the room. And it makes for and whether it's code, whether it's documentation, whether it's whether it's design whether it is, you know, advocacy or any of those things. Like, it really doesn't matter what space it is. Like, juggling, you know, personalities and trying to get people to mesh together is really the hard part. Because when that falls apart, that is what leads to forks. That's what leads to split efforts. That's what leads to project failures and things like that. I, I noticed you said for both forks and pitchforks. Uh, one of the things that's, I mean, it, some of it's personalities and some of it is uh, people who, um, maybe need to learn to work better together in collaboration, but a lot, a lot of it is, uh, this is very personal for so many of us and, uh, it's very hard to not take the smallest things very personally, very quickly, especially when, you know, you, it is something where you put in, you know, a hundred hours a week, both your, your work time and your free time and whatever it's, it's, you know, it's been you know, your life and your passion. And it's very easy for some, you know, somebody's comment that uh, they didn't mean a certain way that, that sounds dismissive to set you off or for, um, you know, even things that started as technical to become very, um, just adversarial, um, and so it it is it is a hard thing to deal with. Just gonna add that codes of conduct make collaboration easier. It's uh, definitely something we implement and use in the Fedora community to make things easier for folks to work together, and it's definitely helped. I don't know if codes of conduct in themselves help, but having a process to make that code of conduct work is, I think probably more important because I have been involved in a ton of projects that have them, not naming any particular names, but they have code of conducts and things like that, but with no mechanism to make them real, to make them enforceable. They're just words on a digital paper. They don't mean anything. Like it's, it's quite one thing to just say, you know, we're going to copy the contributor covenant or insert your favorite template of a code of conduct here. It's quite another to say, I'm going to back this up with action when somebody actually like points something out and, and says that this is a problem. And in a lot of open source projects and a lot of communities, sometimes you just have one without the other. And that's just, it doesn't work. It's not enough. You have to mean what you say and say what you mean. Can we lighten the mood a little bit more? And <laughs> we'll we'll talk about like so you know with with collaboration. What what do you all think could be improved? I mean, I think we've hit on a few things already, um, for sure. But um, is there anything other things that come to mind? I think the advantage we have is our distributions are so large, and we have so many individual pieces. And in some cases, it we won't be able to collaborate, although the additional time effort to agree on something would be way too much that it isn't worth it, basically. But you have so many packages that there are still 
definitely some stacks where we could aim for, where we would be should be able to work together. Uh, I don't know which one to pick first, but we let's say I don't know something Rust if you want if you want to use this example. <laughs> where we Rust have the same pain, same pain, yeah. and uh, where we should yeah yeah. I, I looked at a little Rust project I have that all it does is it, it makes a little world with trees in it that you can move a little figure around this. It has 236 dependencies. Mm -hmm. um, so am I ever going to package that up in the traditional manner? Not if some unless somebody else agrees to package at least 234 of those dependencies. Uh. I have written a extension for VS Code and including development dependencies, it's over 1000 node modules. Yeah. And I have been conservative. <laughs> so I'm not packaging those. Node.js makes me want to replace this yeah. water bottle with something way stronger. <laughs> 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 yeah, but where I definitely see where we could collaborate, where we definitely, I think, can collaborate and should collaborate more is, so for instance, not only the packaging stuff, but also image building, since uh, that's that's something where essentially every distribution has its own tooling. So in the open build service and for the open SUSE distribution, we mostly use Kiwi. Um, Fedora has, uh, I think, Lorax is the tool called. We have there are about... nine. There's nine different build tools in Fedora <laughs> right now for images. Okay, I wasn't aware that it was so many, yeah. but uh, essentially, it's Kiwi is already a pretty is is a pretty powerful tool, and it would be great if we could just uh, if we could also work uh, work together on something there, since Kiwi can build. Fedora images, for instance, it can build Ubuntu. And yeah, uh, Neil is uh, Neil is doing his thing since he brought in a good. Chunk now of now we have ten different ways of doing it. Is what you're saying? I will aggressively yeah, I'm not kill saying all we the other ones. Make a tenth one. <laughs> that I ain't will aggressively help. rip out all the other ones if we replace it with Kiwi because mm. I am so tired of fixing all of them every time I make a change to them. It's a massive time sink and it sucks and everybody should feel ashamed of how many times I have that this wheel has been spun over and over again with square wheels that are chipped at the edges with sharp spikes on the sides. I think another way we can uh, improve the collaboration is, you know, we think a lot of our collaboration tends to focus on very technical things, whether it's, you know, packages or how we're building the process. I don't know that we necessarily are doing a very good job of collaborating on how we build our communities, but, you know, it's really interesting. You know, I was right before the world shut down last year, I was at the scale conference and I spent about an hour in the open SUSE booth talking to an ambassador there and every problem that they said they had, like, that's very familiar. And then, you know, the, the open SUSE, uh, community survey, um, and it was back over the winter, maybe, you know, a lot of the problems I was like, oh, this is, these are the exact same problems that we face in Fedora. And I think it'd be great if we had a way to, um, you know, work together on those things too. Right. Because, you know, like we said, the code is not always the, uh, the hard part. And, and I think there's a lot of benefit, you know, culturally, it feels like our, our projects are very similar. We have a lot of shared, uh, community members. So I think we, you know, collaborating on the, the community parts is a big area that we haven't really tapped yet. I think an unintentional positive of pandemic COVID times has been a nice uh, chance for our communities to engage at a, a higher level at these virtual events. Um, and, ha you know, at Nest and a release party we've had, you know, different organizations come and hang out with Fedora, you know, and this cross collaboration panel is a great example of like something that maybe wouldn't have necessarily happened just this way. Uh, if COVID hadn't happened, we hadn't put more time and energy into virtual events. And I think 
it's given a different swath of people a chance to connect with communities that are tangential. Um, so we've seen more engagement and more folks at our events, and I'm guessing that that is part of it. Um, it's definitely not intentional. It's an observation. <laughs> yeah, but I like to ask again, but if you have a shared community somewhere, then they need to have a shared goal because then they can talk about the same thing. But we would get this if we share some components, if we would have, for example, the same GNOME desktop. Then, of course, if you speak about GNOME, then it doesn't matter if it's Suse or Fedora. So it would be then the, yeah, I, I don't know. Then we would maybe even need a common name, <laughs> something. I don't know. Suse Dora? Suse Dora? <laughs> <laughs> so, Dora is working on a, a community outreach revamp, and uh, when that is is all set and done and has a bow on it, I'd love to share that with other communities so they can adapt it for their purposes. We're, we're planning a resource library, you know, it's going to, it's happening. <laughs> yeah, like, this is something that I kind of ran on in my platform to become a, a board member was um, I, I personally have felt that the OpenSUSE community lacked a particular, um, I want to say empowerment to feel like they could communicate and collaborate and communicate and, and execute on things in, in a way where they felt like they could be seen, like uh, something that was a problem that I had observed, like listening in the OpenSUSE Discord server in the matrix rooms, talking to folks like pretty much everywhere outside of the OpenSUSE factory IRC channel. Um, the common issue was, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how to do something, but I can't figure out how to figure out how to do something. And when I, even if I could figure out how to figure out how to do something, I don't know how to make people know that I did this thing and like maybe look at it or see if it could be made better and things like that. And I feel like this is a problem that spoke to me so very hard <laughs> and um and it's something that uh i'm hoping you know that you know with this closer ties between fedora and open Sousa, we can learn a little bit from each other about how to do that sort of thing so that our community members can feel empowered to drive change excellence and growth in in both projects like both fedora and open Sousa. You know, deserve to be able to be successful and and make you know the the people that use these projects to live to work to play to be happy with it sounds good such a statement matthew but um, Neil, don't you think that this kind of a problem is because we have too many communication channels and they are <laughs> some of them are just too little? I mean, um, so uh, at least with, with everything but IRC and the mailing list, they're all bridged together and unified. So when someone talks from one avenue, the other people, everyone in the other avenues actually can see each other and respond to each other. So it feels a lot more connected than it would like say, for example, if you go into Fedora's uh, matrix discord or telegram rooms, they're a lot more fragmented because there wasn't an intentional approach of connecting them all up front. Whereas when we were introducing the real time chats across the different platforms in OpenSUSE, a distinct goal was making sure they were all connected to each other. Uh, it's generally not allowed to introduce a communications platform that is not connected to the other ones. And so if it's a real time chat platform where users and developers and other folks would be, you know, communicating with each other, there needs to be a way to connect them all so that nobody is missing from the conversation. Uh, and that was something that uh, I think alleviates a lot of that problem, at least on the open SUSE side. The main actual problem has been that we have not been able to connect IRC to all the rest of them because of a whole bunch of historical uh, mess with how the IRC channels were managed um, with the un unfortunate uh, situation around IRC that has happened. Um, 
it has been an opportunity to actually fix that too. So like one of the things that I'm, I'm hoping we can actually resolve soon is bringing everybody, um, you know, into the, onto the same page so that, you know, someone who unfortunately is on IRC can talk to everyone who's on discord matrix, telegram and whatnot, and, and be able to, to do that sort of thing. Um, but the second part of it is not just the real time chats, but like, people don't know how to get started to do something in a lot of cases. And I don't know the answer to that problem. I don't know how to solve, how to help people like get started with their thing other than case by case Neil. things. And that doesn't scale. So Neil, this kind of sort of, sort of solves this problem a little bit in Fedora with the join sig. It's a, like a group of people, it's a chat room and a repo. That's it. It's very like, low commitment effort and it's simply a place to send newcomers and the folks that hang out in that chat room help them open a ticket it's like a little intro ticket trying to like get some information out of them and then they connect them with the group that makes sense so it's a it's a big problem we're solving it with people and it's working pretty well okay cool something to look into then I already noted it too. Um, so it looks like we're sort of hitting that uh, top of the hour. And uh, I think we'll probably um, finish it up. Is there any last words that uh, anyone would like to say? Famous last words, whatnot? I think Neil's. Uh soliloquy from a few minutes ago was an excellent uh, ending point so if you go back to edit this video just stop it there chop it and that that i think that says everything there is to say do a shameless plug uh everyone's invited to mass 2021 and open season will be there so it should be a great time and yeah, adrian uh, will give a great talk about obs stuff and how they're supporting fedora hey. building fedora on it i mean uh, sh should we do this panel at nest I think it'd be fun. It'd be a different, it'd be a second audience. Call call for participation. Still, still open right now. <laughs> yes, it is open until July 16th. Get your proposals in. Sure. But yeah, like I, I'm really happy that we did this. This is, this is really nice. And it lets us show like the perspectives from both of our communities. And hey, Adrian is here, which like I have, I barely ever see Adrian on anything, and that just excites me in a whole different level. I plug my time. It's quite late for me. Sorry. It's not against you. <laughs> I know. Our time zones do not align at all. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you all, and um, enjoy the rest of the conference, and, and thank you for being here. And Thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Bye.